All right, this week is going to focus on metabolism and cellular respiration. This is a list of the learning objectives, and we're going to start with an introduction to metabolism. Energy is the ability to do work or bring about a change, and there's different types of energy that exist. Kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, like mechanical energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of something moving. So if we have a waterfall, there's a lot of kinetic energy there. The water is moving and that can cause other things to move. Potential energy is stored energy. So it's the ability to cause a movement. And we store our potential energy in this molecule known as adenosine triphosphate, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but ATP is our potential energy, it's stored energy. It has the potential to cause a change or to cause a movement. If we have our book teetering on the edge of our desk, it has the potential to fall. Now while it's teetering there, it's considered potential energy. If we were to push it off the table top and now it is falling, that's kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy can be used to make other substances move. And then we have chemical energy. Chemical energy is the energy that is formed in the bonds of the chemicals that we eat. If we look at the flow of energy through organisms, we see that it all starts with the sunlight. Solar energy from the sun hits these producers. Now, producers are going to produce their own food source and then they break down that food source in order to give off energy or to produce energy for themselves. So the sun is our original energy source and that energy is going to be given to the producers to do photosynthesis. to produce their own food. And their own food is usually in the form of a sugar. Although those sugars can be converted to other substances and then used by, as food by the plants. So producers are predominantly plants. But also algae and cyanobacteria can be considered producers because they have the ability to use that energy from the sunlight in order to do the process of photosynthesis. Anyway, so now we've got consumers that come along. So the consumer is going to eat the plant. So the consumer gets energy from the plant, the plant got energy from the sunlight, so it all comes back to the sun. Now other consumers, like humans, can go hunt the moose and then eat the moose. So we are higher up on the food chain, we're also consumers, a consumer can eat a consumer, a consumer can eat a producer, and the producer gets energy from the sun. There's also a thing called decomposers. And decomposers are going to break down dead consumers and producers. So organisms that were once alive and have now died get broken down into simpler parts using the decomposers. Decompos co oh, sorry, decomposers predominantly consist of fungi and bacteria. So coming along in this picture, the process of using energy from the sun to make a food source for these plants, that's photosynthesis and that's what we're going to talk about next week. What we're going to talk about in this week is how we use the food that was produced to make energy inside of one of these consumers and even to use it to make energy inside of one of the producers. So metabolism is a sum of all of the chemical reactions in an organism. It has to do with the free energy, which has, is the amount of energy that's available to do work. There's exergonic or catabolic reactions and endergonic or anabolic reactions. Exergonic reactions are called X because they give off energy, usually in the form of heat.
then catabolism is talking about breaking down substances into their building blocks. So if you were to eat a hamburger and you're digesting that hamburger inside of your stomach and small intestine, as you're breaking those bonds, you're giving off energy. And a lot of that is given off in the form of heat. If you've ever been around cows before or had a cow in a barn in the winter time, you may have seen the cows steaming and you may have noticed that if you close the barn doors and you got a bunch of cows in there, that place heats up just by the heat of the animal. Now that animal isn't a living furnace. What's happening is catabolic reactions in that cow's rumen are performed by the bacteria that live in there. So the bacteria live inside one of the chambers of the cow's stomach and if you feed the cow certain types of diets, it actually causes these bacteria to break it down excessively and produce a lot of heat energy. And you can see that. You can see the heat rising off of these animals. One cow can heat an entire barn all winter long. An endergonic or anabolic reaction is talking about reactions that require energy. So you have to put something into it in order to get the response or to produce a product from that reaction. Anabolic is talking about building substances. So in order to build macromolecules, that requires energy. These are non-spontaneous. You have to have an energy input in order to do them. So catabolism and anabolism, this is what metabolism is. So we have metabolism, which is the sum of all of the chemical reactions in the body, and metabolism includes catabolism, or breaking down substances, and metabolism consists of anabolism, which is building substances. We can think of catabolism like how our food is digested in our digestive tract. We can think of anabolism and how we make macromolecules such as this chain that we see that's being produced here. So those coming together are what metabolism is. Now in order to build things, and we need to build things in the cell all the time and build things for the multicellular organism that we are, we need an energy input. And the most common molecule that's used for energy or as a potential energy source is adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Adenosine triphosphate consists of an adenosine group, and what adenosine is, is adenine and ribose. Where have you heard the term adenine before? That's one of our bases from DNA. If you remember the four bases of DNA, we had adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. So that's one of our DNA bases. Adenine with ribose, well, where did we hear ribose before? RNA. So ribose is the sugar that makes up RNA. So we've got adenine and ribose that come together, and we call that adenosine. And then we have three phosphate groups attached. And I'm going to switch to this picture. So here's our adenine and ribose, and then we have our three phosphate groups. Energy released by an exergonic reaction or is captured or reactions is captured in ATP. ATP is then used to drive an endergonic reaction. So we can release energy by breaking down substances, trap that energy in ATP, and store it until we need to use that ATP to produce something or to perform an endergonic reaction. So where does energy come from with this molecule? Well, this bond here readily wants to break. And breaking of this bond causes a spark, a spark that can create a movement inside of a cell. 
kind of like if you think about an engine, and I don't know much about cars at all, but I know that there's pistons and stuff, and if you throw gasoline on a piston, a little mini explosion happens. It ignites, and that causes the piston to move. If you break this phosphate group off, it's a spark that can cause a movement in the cell. So let's say we do break it off. We break it off, and now that phosphate is released, and we end up with a molecule called adenosine diphosphate. ADP. Plus that free organic phosphate, which is usually abbreviated PI. So we had ATP. And we broke it down, and now we have a DP. Well, why did we have to break it down? Because we wanted to build something in the cell. And we constantly need energy in order for a cell to do anything. So we went from adenosine tri for three to adenosine di for two. And we're talking about the phosphate groups. So we had a molecule that had three phosphate groups, and now we have a molecule that has two phosphate groups, and then this one is kind of freely floating by itself. So we broke it apart, but now we need to rebuild it because we constantly need new energy in the cell. So through this process, we're going to have to take ADP and turn it back into ATP. And this cycle continu continues inside of every living organism. Adenosine triphosphate is broken apart. Then adenosine diphosphate is formed. Adenosine diphosphate has to be converted back to adenosine triphosphate so that this energy molecule can be used again. So why don't we break off this phosphate? So once we're at ADP, why don't we come AMP, adenosine monophosphate? Well, we actually do, but it doesn't give off as much energy. So we only do this occasionally for certain smaller cellular reactions. And in this class, we're not going to get into AMP because it's a little bit more on the long, or along the lines of metabolism. So if you took like a biochemistry class, you'd definitely cover that extensively. But this is just a general biology class. So we're going to try to keep it a little bit more simple. So we have adenosine triphosphate, again, going to ADP. And then we have to go from ADP up to ATP. This process happens all the time, and we constantly have to regenerate the energy. What we're going to talk about later on in today's lecture is how do we do this? How do we regenerate ATP from ADP? That process is known as cellular respiration. And we call it aerobic respiration. If it involves oxygen, we call it anaerobic respiration. If it doesn't involve oxygen. And then there's another process called fermentation that can generate ATP, but it doesn't produce that much. And you end up getting an acid or an alcohol byproduct. So we're going to focus on these processes of how to regenerate ATP as we go through this lecture.